Before atmospheric oxygen became available, organisms were limited to a biochemically inefficient means of extracting energy from fuel molecules, fermentation. Fermentation produced ethyl alcohol, a waste product rich in energy. As oxygen gradually became available, aerobic respiration evolved and changed the course of life on Earth. This is because aerobic cells were more efficient than fermenters, harvesting more energy from fuel molecules, up to 20 times more. Aerobic cells efficiently stripped fuel molecules of energy, leaving carbon dioxide and water. Although aerobic cells were more efficient, low oxygen levels evidently kept life at the microscopic level until sometime around 700 million years ago. At this time, there was an evolutionary explosion of multicellular organisms, including the appearance of the first animals. Why the sudden explosion of animal life around 700 million years back? One theory is that the evolution of these larger, multicellular organisms was made possible by an increase in atmospheric oxygen. Oxygen had been gradually building up since the appearance of cyanobacteria a billion years earlier. Cyanobacteria were the first organisms to carry out oxygen-producing photosynthesis. By 700 million years ago, the time of the great explosion of animal life, cyanobacteria had been joined by green algae and other simple plant-like cells that bubbled oxygen into the atmosphere. Look in a drop of stagnant pond water, an environment low in oxygen. About the only things that thrive here are single cells. Larger aquatic organisms tend to favor well-oxygenated environments. These differences are explained by comparing the surface volume relationship of larger and smaller organisms. This cube has a surface area of six units and a volume of one cubic unit. A surface volume ratio of six to one. Eight cubes together have a surface of 24 and a volume of eight. In other words, a surface to volume ratio of three to one. This stack has a ratio of one to one. Clearly, as an organism's surface increases, the area for absorbing oxygen relative to volume gets smaller. This limits the size of organisms that can live in low concentrations of oxygen. 700 million years ago, as oxygen levels increased, a larger interior volume could be supplied, making possible the evolution of large multicellular organisms. A cell carrying out aerobic respiration has inputs and outputs. Inputs include fuel in the form of carbohydrates and lipids, and oxygen. The outputs are carbon dioxide and water. What goes on in between is largely a matter of extracting energy from the fuel molecules. The energy gained is used for cell processes, energy for movement, transporting materials into cells, electrical activities, and synthesizing new products. Carbon dioxide is the carbon residue of carbohydrate and lipid molecules that have been stripped of energy. The reactions of aerobic respiration supply the energy needed to convert ADP adenosine diphosphate to ATP, adenosine triphosphate, a cell's primary energy carrier. ATP travels the cell's interior, ready to donate energy to energy-needy reactions. 
In these reactions, the end phosphate is released, converting ATP to ADP. So ATP acts like a rechargeable battery to do cell work. Where the battery is charged is the topic of the next module. Most of a cell's ATP synthesis occurs in a particular cell organelle, the mitochondrion. The inner sac contains folds, or in other types, fingers, that increase the surface area where the reactions of aerobic respiration occur. The outer membrane contains proteins that form channels that allow fuel molecules to enter. The region between the two membranes is called the intermembrane space. The inner membrane surrounds the region called the matrix. The matrix contains the enzymes that dismantle fuel molecules. The knobs are the sites where the ATP is synthesized. So, fuel molecules and oxygen enter here, undergo processing here. The ADP-ATP reaction occurs on the inner membrane, and ATP leaves to circulate in the cell. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the mitochondrion and leaves the cell. Two kinds of fuel molecules enter mitochondria, fatty acids and pyruvate. A three-carbon compound made by splitting glucose through a multi-stepped process called glycolysis. In the matrix, pyruvate attaches to a carrier to form a compound called acetyl coenzyme A. Also, fatty acids are broken down into two carbon molecules to form more acetyl-CoA. The constant supply of acetyl-coenzyme A feeds a chemical cycle called the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle breaks down the carbon chains, releasing carbon dioxide. Also liberated are the hydrogen ions and electrons needed to make the energy carrier NADH. NADH transfers its energetic electrons into a part of the ATP assembly line called the electron transport chain. The events described in this module occur on the inner membrane of a mitochondrion. A key player is this molecule, NADH, produced in the Krebs cycle, along with hydrogen ions. On the inner membrane of the mitochondrion are proteins that make up an energy transferring system called the electron transport chain. This is where NADH and hydrogen ions play their role. The electron transport proteins are, in effect, electron-powered pumps that drive hydrogen ions out of the matrix and into the intermembrane space. The electrons to power the pumps are supplied by NADH. The electron transport chain is an extremely efficient way to put energy to work. It's as if the electron were a ball rolling down a ramp. You could let it go with an explosion of wasted energy at the bottom. Or you could position a series of generators along the path and extract energy in a controlled way. That's what the electron transport chain does. Each pump takes some of the electron's energy and uses it to transfer hydrogen ions out of the matrix and into the intermembrane space. Oxygen's strong affinity for electrons is what produces the electron fall that drives the pumps, setting up conditions for ATP synthesis.
The electrochemical activities that occur in the matrix and on the inner membrane of a mitochondrion make possible the synthesis of ATP. The theory explaining ATP synthesis is called the chemiosmosis theory. ATP synthesis by chemiosmosis is thought to work like this. When the electron transport chain pumps hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space, the buildup creates an imbalance, both in charge and in concentration. The imbalance strongly favors the flow of hydrogen ions back into the matrix. Special membrane proteins called ATP synthetase, the knob seen on the inner membrane, act as valves, allowing the hydrogen ions to escape in a controlled way. ATP synthetase uses energy from the backflow of hydrogen ions to couple a phosphate group onto ADP, making ATP. Because oxygen creates a very strong electron fall, chemiosmosis generates large quantities of ATP. A single sugar molecule metabolized by a cell mitochondrion produces 38 ATPs. The same sugar metabolized by an anaerobic bacterium produces two ATPs. Aerobic respiration is nearly 20 times as efficient at stripping the energy from fatty acids and carbohydrates. Plant cell mitochondria carry out the same basic processes found in animal cell mitochondria. The only difference is that plant cells have the carbohydrate-making equipment on board. They're chloroplasts.